Hello, everyone. Sorry, we are a few minutes late because at four o'clock load shedding kicked in <laughs> and only now everything came up again. So this afternoon, um, we are very happy to have Dr. Yapi Kapis uh, with us. Yapi is the deputy director of the School of Computer Science and Information Systems at Northwest University. <clears throat> and at short notice, he agreed to give us uh, um, a talk this evening on the advantages and challenges of artificial intelligence for universities. And um, <clears throat> it doesn't have the word ChatGPT in the title, but I assume that's probably what he means. Yeah. So Yapi, please, uh, you already started sharing your screen. You're most than welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesco. I'm gonna stop my video here just in case my network uh, lets me down, but uh, yes. As was, as was mentioned, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on the advantages and challenges of artificial intelligence for universities. So, I mean, obviously this, uh, this talk it was a little bit short notice because it is a talk that I've given a, a, a little bit earlier in the year. That was probably Yapi's load shedding. <laughs> okay, let's wait a minute. Let's give him a chance to join us uh, again. <clears throat> Just a little moment of patience.
Okay. Yep, you should join us in a few seconds. Just a minute of patience, please. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Francesco. Yapi is back. <laughs> so without further ado, Yapi, you're welcome to share the screen and start. Thank you very much to everyone for the patience. Thank you. Let me set up my screen share here. Uh, this is the one I want. And enter mode. All right, Francesco, can you just uh, let me know, can uh, everyone see my screen? Uh, yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. Perfect. All right. Uh, sorry for, for that, everyone. This was, uh, you know, it, it, it makes you wonder whether we should worry about artificial intelligence if we can't even get uh, screen sharing uh, to work uh, reliably. So, so maybe we're not in so much trouble. But uh, okay, for this uh, this afternoon session, this is a presentation that's maybe a little bit uh, a little bit old if you consider how quickly these things move. But uh, I just wanted to talk a little about the advantages and challenges of artificial intelligence uh, for universities. So obviously, this is looking very much at, at, at academics at universities, but I hope it's uh, it's going to be applicable a little bit wider as well. So who am I? Uh, I'm Dr. Yopi Khrif. I'm Deputy Director for the School of Computer Science and Information Systems at Northwest University. I'm also a Research Program Lead for Technology Capability and Functioning at the Optentia Research Unit. I'm an Associate of NITEX, uh, which is obviously why I'm here, and then I'm also a member of the Unit for Data Science and Computing at Northwest University. So in terms of uh, what we will talk about today, um, we're going to be just looking at a little bit of an introductory session on the things that we should be considering at the moment with the changes that have been happening. Uh, we're going to look at what intelligence is, what weak artificial intelligence is, and what strong or general artificial intelligence is. We're going to look at some critiques, risks, warnings, fears, um, you know, just a little bit of the, the philosophical side of things. We're going to look at generative AI and, uh, and how that works. Um, we're going to look then at the pedagogical aspect of things, so what sort of skills students should have. And then I want to talk about the concept of creativity in pedagogy. So taking that agenda into account, I mean, we obviously start with this concept of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if you've been in academia for any amount of time, you will realize that this has been a hot topic for, things, for people for the last, you know, probably almost 10 years. We've been talking about it for ages and people are saying that we're entering into the fourth industrial revolution, but it is really at the end of last year when, when ChatGPT hit us that we really reached a point where we are now completely immersed in it. There is no entering into the fourth industrial revolution. We are there. Things have, have changed um, irrevocably and, uh, and we need to work out how we're going to deal with these things. So um, some of these things are still going to come, uh, but many of these problems that, uh, that arise are, are with us already. So we need to work out as you know, faculty members, how do we actually deal with, with you know, many of these issues that arose? 
So there are some topics that uh, that we should already be talking about. So uh, Francesco obviously mentioned ChatGPT. If you are not already talking about ChatGPT, you're probably in a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, this is uh, this is. I would I don't want to say old news by now, but it has definitely been used for quite a while. So, you know, using ChatGPT for, for by students to generate answers is something that, you know, in the first semester of this year, we saw a massive amount of uh, at my university, but also all universities. Uh, but also, you know, using ChatGPT more in more advanced ways to kind of guide research at the postgraduate level to find new information. This is something that, that you really should discuss at your university level. Another thing that you should also be discussing is really how faculty is using ChatGPT at this point in time. So, I mean, it's it's no longer the case where you need to generate all of your problems by hand for everything. You can generate them automatically using generative AI. You can use ChatGPT to take a problem that you've set for students and get it to generate a rubric for you. And once you've generated that rubric, you can use the same tool to mark your rubric uh, or to mark a student's work against that rubric. So the way in which we teach is also fundamentally going to change as we get you know, more and more and more comfortable with these technologies. Another area that we should be looking at is automation. Now, I mean, we've always wanted to have our, our learning management systems be you know, a little bit more intelligent. But with the rise of things like robotic process automation, the entire academic process and the way we give feedback and the way we grade uh, when we you know, use automation in conjunction with large language models is fundamentally different now to what it was you know, five years ago. So this is something that you should actively be talking about in your departments because it is something that is not just going to change, it has already changed. Other things that, uh, that we should look at is concept like plagiarism. Uh, what is plagiarism? Is it really uh, an act of plagiarism to take something that was generated by a large language model and use it in a project? Um, and if it is not plagiarism, how do you source that thing? Is it something that you need to give a reference for? Do you see a large language model as a co-author? Um, you know, there needs to be some sort of policy involved at your university, either being written or already written to deal with that. The same with the concept of copyright. Um, you know, this, this has always been a little bit of a fuzzy concept in, in many ways uh, when you look at things from the perspective of software. But now, you know, generative AI is generating, um, you know, pieces of text or images or video based on other people's work, but not necessarily the exact same work. So how far does, does copyright stretch? Um, what is the idea of fundamental knowledge in your specific discipline? So there are so many things that you can now just look up or you know, ask ChatGPT to give you an answer on that I think it changes the way different fields need to think about the concepts of fundamental knowledge to those fields. Um, finding sources. If ChatGPT is a source in and of itself, I mean, how do you find other sources to supplement that? How do you check it, et cetera? So there are so many conversations that should be happening at your department already um, that uh, if they're not happening, you're in trouble, okay? So that is just a, a little bit of an introduction to kind of sow a little bit of panic. But I think at this point, let us take a little bit of a step back and just consider the concept of intelligence. And, and what do we mean by, by intelligence? So this is a term that has a variety of different definitions by different authors. It's, it's something that's changed you know, over, over the years. Um, one of the ones that, that I actually quite like, not because it's necessarily the, the most, you know, the latest one or probably even the one that's used so much, it just actually touches quite nicely on what intelligence is in artificial intelligence as well. And that is the one by Verschler. Uh, so the Verschler test is what we would more commonly call the IQ test which was one of the first widely used tests to determine what you know, the level of intelligence is or the intelligence quotient of a person. And Wechsler put forward in 1944 that intelligence is the aggregate or global capacity of the individual to act purposefully, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with its environment. Okay? So it's not the only definition or even a universally accepted one. It just is a, a pretty good one to start with. So that is what we would think of as human intelligence and our capabilities. But what do we think is, or what do we think of when we think of artificial intelligence? 
And again, there are various definitions that exist, uh, and partially because it is largely a moving target. But one of the definitions that I quite like is by Rich, uh, or Rich and uh, she says that artificial intelligence is the study of how to make computers do things at which, at the moment, people are better. Um, so again, there are multiple definitions, but that is just the one I'm going to run with a little bit, uh, but in this talk. But when we consider this idea of artificial intelligence, there are really three levels of artificial intelligence when we're talking about these things. So there's weak or narrow artificial intelligence, strong or general artificial intelligence, and finally, super artificial intelligence. So the first one we're going to look at is what we would call weak artificial intelligence. And here I'm going to go from the perspective of what we would call an intelligent agent. You just take a sip of water. Again, it's not the only perspective you can take. But if you look at that, uh, that definition of intelligence we got from Verschler, um, this is actually looking at artificial intelligence in very much the same way, in that you've got an agent program that is situated inside of an agent. And that agent has sensors through which it takes presets uh, from its environment. And it has actuators, which allows it to take actions in its environment. Now, this environment could be a physical environment in the case of a, you know, a robotic system. It can be a software environment. It is really just where you position this agent um, and allow it to take these actions that is going to determine you know, the, the nature of it. And if you think about it in a very sort of broad way, those three kind of main components of this agent would be representative of, you know, the agent program being the brain, the sensors being the inputs, and the actuators being the outputs of this artificial intelligent agent. And when we are defining or designing this artificial intelligence agent, we would consider this, you know, the, the tasks we wanted to do within the context of its environment. And we use for that the acronym, uh, or acronym of P's, okay? where we will have some sort of a performance measure to tell us how, how well our agent is actually doing inside of this environment. We will have the environment itself. We will have a list of the actuators it can use and the list of sensors that it can use. And when we look at you know, the plan for this agent, we're going to you know, look at the environment a little bit, in a little bit more detail. So our environment could either be fully or partially observable, could be a deterministic or a stochastic environment, could be an episodic or a sequential environment, static environment or a dynamic environment, one that is discrete in nature or continuous in nature. There could be only one agent in the environment or it could be a multi-agent system. And we could also have only a certain level of knowledge of the physical laws that, that are at play within this environment. So these are the ways in which you would describe this environment for this agent that you are designing. And then at the same time, you would look at those three main components, being the brain, the inputs, and the outputs. And, uh, and there are a variety of, uh, of techniques that we can use uh, for these components. So for the brain, we could use machine learning, deep learning. We could use more traditional logic-based uh, systems. We could use search algorithms, statistics. We could probably even just hard code a bunch of logic into the system. Uh, there are a variety of ways in which we could decode the brain of this artificial intelligence agent. And then the inputs, it's going to depend again on whether we have a robotics kind of system or whether it's largely software agent. Uh, we can have computer vision, natural language processing, uh, a bunch of robotic sensors, traditional inputs and outputs in terms of digital streams. Uh, we could use robotic process automation to collect or, or act on things. That's on the input side. On the output side, we could again answer with text using natural language processing. We could you know, physically act in the environment using our robotic actuators. We could generate multimedia in the forms of you know, text, images, video, sound. Um, we can read and write files. Uh, or we could again use robotic process automation to control other processes. Uh, that this agent finds itself, you know, in the midst of. And these sorts of agents are really things that have been with us for quite a, quite a long time. Um, you know, the concept of the agent actually spanned back to you know, the previous century. So this is not new. And what we find really is that weak artificial intelligence that solves very specific problems is a very well-known field with numerous successful applications. Um, what has changed in the last couple of years is now the rise of generative artificial intelligence, which is slightly different. 
And this is starting to aim more towards the goals of strong artificial intelligence, though I don't think we're there yet, um, obviously, but, uh, but it is a different way of approaching artificial intelligence to what we were doing previously with just the agent methodology. Another thing that has changed quite a bit is that the barrier to entry has become much lower. Previously, you would need to be a, an expert in these fields in order to get any kind of results from, uh, from these sorts of agents. Now that is no longer the case. It is very, very quick to upskill yourself in these sorts of systems. So when I say there's a difference between a weak and a strong AI, this is mainly around its ability to solve multiple kinds of problems rather than just one kind of problem. So a weak AI is often going to be a sort of industrial process. You have a model that looks at one kind of thing. It does predictions. It does classifications. But it's, it's not a general purpose model uh, for the most part. Or it can solve you know, maybe a small amount of problems, but it's not, it's not general purpose. Whereas a strong artificial intelligence is one that can solve multiple kinds or any kinds of problems in a similar way to what a human can. And the reason this has become you know, relevant for us to talk about is that traditionally, from a philosophical and sort of risk analysis point of view, the, the concept of a general AI has, has been seen as something that would be quite risky because once you've got something that can solve any kind of problem and can make itself smarter by solving more and more problems and kind of recoding itself, it would not be very long before you have a super artificial intelligence. And that is something that is significantly smarter than we are as humans and would be an existential threat to us uh, because we, would ju we just wouldn't understand. It'd be something that is beyond us. Okay? So that is sort of from the philosophy side of things been the risk and why people have said we don't want to have general AI. But now we say at the moment that we are not there yet. Okay, so we, we are absolutely at the point where we're doing you know, weak artificial intelligence, we're touching on, uh, on general intelligence, but, but we're not there yet. And the question now becomes, how do we know when we actually have reached that point? So when can we say that we do have a general intelligence? And for this, there have actually been a number of tests that have been proposed to see whether we've reached this point of no return. If it really is as risky as people say, you know, then we obviously want some way to measure it. And, and I've highlighted sort of five tests that, uh, that have been relevant, uh, you know, in the last couple of years. And the first one is the Turing test. So that is the one that, uh, that everyone should probably be uh, familiar with. Uh, it's basically you, you have a console that you're talking to an agent on the other side of a curtain with. Um, there's two agents, one of them human, one is a machine. You spend a couple of minutes conversing with, with these two different agents. And at the end of the process, someone asks you whether you can tell the difference between which one is the machine, which one the human. If you cannot tell the difference between a human and a machine, then you've reached intelligence. Um, so this was the one that was put forward initially by Alan Turing, which he called initially the imitation game. And this test has... For the most part, people consider this to have been passed. Um, by about 2014, there is an AI called Eugene Gustman that managed to convince 30% of the judges uh, in, in a Turing test that it was human. So uh, at least from that perspective, people don't consider this to be a relevant test anymore because we've passed it and you know, it really doesn't seem like it's had any kind of damage. The next test that, that became relevant was what we called the robot college student test. And this was basically saying that, well, you would need a much wider level of knowledge um, to be a human other than just you know, the ability to communicate. So the question becomes, can a machine pass college level courses like a human student could? And at this point, uh, ChatGPT4 has basically passed pretty much any undergraduate degree in any field kind of worldwide. There are still tests ongoing. But I mean, it's also managed to pass multiple bar exams. It's managed to pass the medical examiner's exam in America. Um, there's professional exams that have been passed. So in terms of passing tests that are in the form of examinations, it seems that large language models can do that very effectively. But again, we've said, well, that's maybe not you know, a true indicator of intelligence. Another test that's become relevant is the employment test to say that, well, I mean, testing and asking questions and giving answers is something that an AI can do, but that's not the only thing that humans do. 
So the question becomes, can an artificial intelligence perform the job of a worker in a general working environment with the same interfaces that humans would use? And at this point, we are replacing human workers with AI workers at an incredible pace, especially when we consider the combination of generative AI, uh, well, and in fact, even weak AI combined with robotic process automation. There are so many office jobs that have, uh, that have become you know, uh, replaced at this point in time. So again, this is a test that we've passed, and we've then considered it to not necessarily be that risky. The next test uh, that was proposed uh, to try and make it a little bit harder was the IKEA test. So this one says, can an artificial intelligence that controls a bunch of you know, robotic sensors and actuators assemble a chair? So, so one of those things that you would buy from a shop like Macro, you buy this flat pack of wood, and in the end, once you've assembled it, it becomes a chair. And you want it to take that wood and the tools that it is given inside of that kit, along with the information that is in that kit, and see whether it can work out how to assemble a chair. Okay? This one was partially completed in 2018. However, there was some human assistance in terms of the step order. Um, so it wasn't that the, uh, that the machine completely worked out all the steps itself. It looked at the instructions that it got, but it didn't know how to, you know, put all the screws in, uh, in one little bowl and put all the little, you know, attachments in one place. Uh, the ordering of things wasn't really, you know, the planning side didn't work particularly well. But it absolutely managed to assemble a chair with some assistance. So at least this one is partially passed at this point. The final test that people have now reckoned uh, is a relevant one is the coffee test. And this one basically says, can an AI controlling a robotic body walk into any random person's house, find the kitchen and work out for itself how to make a cup of coffee? And this is an unsolved problem, okay? At this point, we, we do not have an answer to this. But now the question becomes, how smart is too smart? Because every time we meet one of these goals, we, we shift the goalpost, okay? So we say for ourselves on the one hand that creating general intelligence is super dangerous, but at the same time, we're saying, well, we don't really know what that level of danger is, and we're just gonna keep on generating things, and we're, and we're pretty certain everything is just gonna be fine in the long run. So we, we don't know at what point, at this point in time, the level of autonomy becomes less useful and more dangerous. And this is not necessarily a new thing. Um, one of the, uh, the relevant uh, um, uh, papers to have been written on this was by someone called Samuel Butler. And this was actually not uh, um, written as an academic paper, it was written to a newspaper. And uh, the idea behind this paper was, it was called Darwin and the Machines. And Mr. Butler put forward that you know, machines are continuously getting smarter and smarter, okay? But humans are also evolving over time. But the problem is that human evolution and animal evolution takes place with positive and negative mutations, okay? So sometimes things work, sometimes things don't. And it's, it's a little bit of a random process of mutations that, that lead to a better result over time. Whereas machines are just becoming smarter and smarter and smarter and uh, becoming better and better at solving problems, and they're ex experiencing no negative mutations. This is something that is happening in a very unbalanced way. So his thesis was that because of this imbalance and the speed of evolution, it is inevitable that at some point machines will overtake us just because of the way we are dealing with them at this point. And the reason this is an interesting article is that this was written in 1863. So this was done when we were looking at mechanical calculators and mechanical lathes and mechanical systems that were doing more and more and more complex mechanical operations. And even at that point, there were people that were, that were starting to get worried about this. So we didn't listen then, and we sure as hell not listening now. So it is just something to, to consider. Now, when we say there is risk, uh, I'm only going to spend one you know, slide on this because this is a little bit of a, you know, a bit more philosophy, but uh, the concept is called the technological uh, singularity. And various uh, writers have uh, put forward prospective dates for this. 
Um, so some of them have considered, you know, between 2005 and 2030 as, uh, as, uh, as potential dates. Ray Kurzweil, who tends to be looked at quite well with, uh, from a futurist perspective, he reckoned that it would take about 2029 would be the point where, where things become bad for us. Um, Hans Moravec put forward 2040. Um, and in 2012, uh, between 2012 and 2013, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, researchers uh, put forward a poll um, amongst specialists and, and researchers at different universities to find out what the general feeling in the, uh, in the community was. And they got to a 50% confidence that we would hit artificial general intelligence somewhere between 2040 and 2050. So it doesn't seem that we're there yet, but uh, depending on who you believe, we may be closer or further than, than what we think we are at this point in time. So, I mean, that's obviously the, the, the prediction. So how scared are we actually about this, you know, at, at this point in time? Now in March of this year, the Future of Life Institute put forward an open letter and it was signed by a huge number of people. At the start of June, when, when I set up this presentation, it had almost 32,000 signatures. And uh, it was by a bunch of AI researchers, industry experts, you know, people that are active in the field. And they called for a six month pause on all artificial intelligence development. And I mean, these were not just random people. So, I mean, this is people like Joshua Bengio, who was a Turing Prize winner in the field of artificial intelligence. Stuart Russell, who authored, you know, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. John Hopfield, who invented, you know, the Associative Neural Network. They, I mean, the list goes on. So this open letter was, was a bit of a, a red flag for many people where they said, you know, wow, these are, these are big names in the field who are calling for this pause because at this point, we don't quite know what the impact is going to be. Things are developing and, and we're just not sure. So that was March of 2023. In June of 2023, the Center for AI Safety put forward this sentence where they said, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. So they were taking no prisons. Again, um, they focused very much on academic signing this. Um, so Stuart Russell again signed. His co-author, who was head of research at Google for a long time, Peter Norvig, also signed this, uh, this uh, um, very uh, inflammatory statement. Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, that developed ChatGPT, um, the lead uh, for Google's DeepMind, Dennis Hassabas. Um, again, Joshua Bengio signed. So they are, I, I wouldn't say everyone is necessarily this worried, but there is a core of people that feels that the speed at which these things are developing is something that we should be really worried about. Now, that is on the academic side, okay? There's also a legislative side that people have now started putting for a couple of laws um, to say that, well, maybe we should control these things a little bit better than, we, than, than what we've done in the past. And some of those laws have been around, you know, again, copyright, level of automation, what you should take into account in terms of, you know, uh, replacing people's jobs. But the one that really got me all excited was, was actually by uh, an American senator who basically put forward a law to say that at this point in time, there is no law against making it such that nuclear weapons can be fired purely controlled by artificial intelligence. So no one's doing this, but at this point, there's, there's no check in place to say that it, that it can't happen. And he suggested that maybe this should be a check that should be put in place. There, there should be a law to say that no one should be able to fire nuclear weapons without meaningful human control. Now that is one of the most obvious laws I have seen in my entire life, but it's really good that someone is actually putting it forward, okay? Now, I mean, on the one hand, you would think that that is so obvious that you shouldn't do something that's stupid. And yet, at the same time, the Air Force is absolutely giving its military drones the ability to recognize faces and make decisions based on artificial intelligence. So it's not that nukes are being launched, but there are other things that also cause explosions, and those seems to absolutely be you know, uh, controllable by AI. 
So there's clearly a need to consider the ethical and legal ramifications of these decisions, which is not keeping, it's not keeping track with the speed at which these developments are happening. Okay. So, I mean, the military and you know, existential risks are the obvious ones, okay? but those are not the only risks that we should take into account. There are also economic, societal, and scientific risks that, that we should really think about. Um, so if I go through them at first, I mean, the workforce skill shift. So there's always been this, you know, this risk with an industrial revolution that new technology brings about a change in the value of work that people are doing. Um, it's just that this one is going really, really fast. And what's different with this uh, revolution is that in previous years, the, the changes have all been around normal labor. Um, so, so it was, you know, factory jobs or agricultural jobs or, you know, things that wouldn't take a huge amount of time to train someone to do, at least to a competent level. Um, so, I mean, there was always a, a need for specialists in their fields uh, and specialist craftsmen, but your everyday sort of generic crafts would be the ones that would be replaced. However, now we are seeing that there is an, a, a measurable impact on jobs like programming, writing and proofreading, translation, graphic design, the kinds of jobs that actually require quite a lot of training to do um, are now being replaced by robotic process automation and, uh, and artificial intelligence. So the, the way the, the workforce skill is shifting is something that is quite concerning at this point. Another thing that, uh, that I found quite fascinating, and it would be interesting to see whether this is going to have an impact or not, is the concept of economic agents. Now, I mean, algorithmic trading has been a popular field since the 1970s. It's really not new, okay? It's just that algorithmic trading has always been based on what's happening in the market. And it's generally been kind of predicting on the data that's inside of it, okay? So people would use algorithmic trading uh, to, to sort of make better decisions much faster than they could uh, inside of systems that they have full control of. What's happening now, however, is that the very open-ended nature of these large language models is allowing people to do things that, that just wouldn't be sensible previously. And, uh, and, the and the concept that's being covered is called Hustle GPT. And it started with a guy called Jackson Greathouse, uh, well, at least uh, that was that was Twitter handle. And his plan was basically to say that uh, he would take a hundred dollars and give full control over to the machine. Okay, so he will be the human liaison. He will act as the eyes and hands of the machine, but the machine would have to tell him exactly how he could make the most amount of money given this hundred dollars of, uh, of start of capital, okay? And although it's a fun experiment, they've now started realizing that it's actually not, uh, not an ineffective strategy. And in many cases, when looked at retrospectively, uh, large language models can outperform most traders very, very effectively. But now the issue is that with algorithmic trading, there wasn't this idea of a centralized point that was making all of these algorithmic decisions. It was more of an ensemble of decisions of multiple people doing algorithmic trading. The idea of giving a huge amount of wealth to one central point that can then meta trade in the system could be quite detrimental to an economic system that, uh, that can be swung if there is enough money in the system. So it's not so much the idea as the fact that people are so willing to put so much control in the hands of something that is at this point not always that well understood. So that's the economic side of things. Obviously the societal side, I mean, this is not new uh, in any way, shape or form, but fake news. I mean, the, the ability to generate text and images has, has led to a point or has gotten to a point where it is really different, difficult um, to see just from a, a quick glance whether an image is, is real or fake. Um, and the, the old saying that a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on is very relevant. 
because you don't need to necessarily create a fake news article and have it be believed forever. It really only needs to be believed for a couple of hours for you to make a huge amount of chaos with it. So fake news is something that is very risky. Something that is uh, sort of derived from that, um, and it actually, one of the first ones I came across is called Claudia, is fake people. I mean, just literally catfishing other people and you know cheating them out of money by creating fake accounts that sort of automatically generate themselves um, to make it seem legitimate. Uh, it becomes a lot harder to trust the people that you interact with online if there is a, you know, a meaningful risk that they could be not real people. Another one that, that I think is, is not always seen in as much of a risk, but I think it is actually quite a risk, is creative devaluation. So there's a number of projects going on at the moment where people are trying to create a world where, and it seems very idyllic in many ways, but the idea is that you would be able to put into the machine you know, I'm, I, I like, and the example I've used here is, uh, is um, online sponge or auto sponge. Um, so I like the idea of SpongeBob SquarePants cartoons. Create for me 24 hours of SpongeBob SquarePants cartoons so that I can be entertained for the next 24 hours. Um, or, you know, new songs that are being developed based on old songs that, uh, author, uh, that artists have made um, that are in their style, that are copying their, you know, unique talents. Um, using artificial intelligence is creating a world where those sorts of artistic endeavors are not as valuable as they were previously. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So we've seen the rise of AI generated music or video and all sorts of things. And although there are some creative people that are embracing this technology and using it to create new forms of art, this is creating a bit of an existential crisis for many artists. Okay? Uh, another one that, that touches a little bit more on the teaching side of things is actually the scientific side. And, and, it's, and it's related to this concept of hallucination in, um, in a generative AI. So just because ChatGPT has given you an answer, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It, it, it will tell you with the same level of confidence, complete nonsense as what it will give you factual information. And uh, in this, I will actually use an example from, from one of my students in, uh, in the first semester of this year, where I allowed my students uh, free reign to use generative AI. And in one of the, uh, the assignments, uh, they were looking at swarm intelligence. And either the AI uh, misunderstood that, or the student just typed it incorrectly. But what came out was actually swamp intelligence instead of then swarm intelligence. And this, the, the generated contact was a sort of mushing together of the concepts of animals in swamps, while at the same time looking at search algorithms, which was also you know, part of the, of the assignment um, and other nature inspired algorithms. So what was interesting is that between the student's mistake and or potentially the student's mistake and the hallucination of the, of the large language model, it came up with a novel idea to use the movements of animals like alligators and turtles that navigate the very complex environment of a swamp to create optimization uh, algorithms for complex problems. And this is a unique idea. So it's potentially novel, but at this point, it's completely imaginary. And if students are given the ability to use these tools, they can be led down incorrect paths quite a bit further than what they would have if they were doing you know, traditional research. So there is this risk that students will, will get incorrect information and assume it is completely true just simply because of the way they're interacting with the system. So this is also a bit of a risk, okay? So, I mean, that's, I'm gonna stop at this point with the philosophy as you, uh, as you can imagine that there's so much more to discuss. But uh, at this point, I mean, maybe it's time to just look a little bit at, uh, at these systems and what we, what we want to talk about. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, obviously, this is a, a bit of a, a higher level talk. But I mean, we will talk a little bit about their work. And uh, as I mentioned, the one that, that's relevant to this conversation is really generative AI. Um, and generative AI takes in some sort of prompt or base information and it generates new information from it. 
Now this prompting information, the input can be in the form of text, it could be images, data or video, depending on you know, what kind of system you're looking at. And the sort of poster child for this has been obviously ChatGPT. Eh? ChatGPT is basically based on a large language model. So uh, with these models, they basically, uh, they're based on what's called the transformer architecture. And they generate their response of using a massive statistical model um, and effectively generate their words one by one. Okay? So they've been taught on a huge corpus of text. Uh, the main ones that seem to, to inf uh, influence ChatGPT or even GPT-3 before that was Common Crawl, Web Text 2, Books 1 and 2, as well as the whole of Wikipedia. And there seems to be uh, an amplification or suppression process where certain weights are, or certain you know, uh, sources of data are given a little bit more weight than what other ones are. So things like books are not given quite as much weight as you know, necessarily uh, Wikipedia for that matter. Okay. Um, there are a number of different large language models at this point in time. So obviously ChatGPT is the poster child, but there's also things like Bard and Rama and you know uh, some of the more open open source ones uh, that that are available at this point in time to play with. But they all function on largely the same sort of approach. Now, in terms of their capabilities, specifically around text. Now, obviously GPT-4 is supposed to give us all these abilities with images, but the main way that people are going to use it is with text. And what is quite interesting about it is because of the way it is taught with this huge corpus of, of information, it is actually quite capable in multiple languages and not just English. Um, so English is the one that it is the most capable on, but if you think of a South African context, um, it, it is almost as capable on Afrikaans as it is in English. And one of the benchmarks that is used to see how capable this, this large language model is, is the MMLU. So it is uh, the massively multi multitask language understanding uh, uh, test, which is 14,000 multiple choice questions that cover 57 areas of specialization in 27 different languages. So this specific test they did in 27 different languages. The base one is, is, is just in English. Now, uh, when you would, if you were to take just random guesses, so each of the multi-choice uh, multi, uh, uh, or multi-answer uh, questions have four potential answers. So if you were to guess randomly, you would expect to get 25% accuracy, okay? Um, when testing this data set using Mechanical Turk, which is a way that you can sort of outsource machine learning uh, um, uh, uh, data uh, um, activities, um, they got just normal Mechanical Turk users to also take the test, and they got an average about 34.5% um, you know, score on this test. So better than random. I mean, the average person knows more than just random, but not a huge amount. And they found that their average benchmark for an expert in one of those fields. So if uh, one, of the, one of the areas or areas of specialization that is, that is asked in the test is based on the uh, medical practitioner's examination in America. And for example, a medical doctor that passes that should be able to get about 89.8% accuracy. Um, and they found that GPT-4, when tested in English, would get about 85.5% accuracy. So it's not quite at the level of you know, an expert necessarily, but it is very, very close. And uh, that's obviously just the text and the sort of general knowledge kind of capabilities of these large language models. But now text is not the only thing it can generate. As I mentioned earlier, it can, mention, it can do things like rubric generation and you know, it can mark things with rubrics. But one of the things that is, it's actually quite fascinating, but I mean, you would think that OpenAI is a company that makes software and artificial intelligence. So they would obviously be on the side of programmers. But one of the reasons why these large language models have gotten so good at coding is that OpenAI decided to hire about a thousand contractors to just write basic programs over and over and over again with different examples. And their core goal seems to be that they want to make basic programming completely obsolete. So this is a focus area for them where they want to make the capabilities of these large language models such that you can give them any kind of vague problem 
um, and ask it to write you a Python script to, to solve that problem, and it would do it quite well. And I mean, I say with a little bit of shame that this is something that I use, uh, you know, very much in my own work as well. Um, I find myself so much more productive when coding with uh, with ChatGPT or, you know, Copilot um, helping me out as what I was previously. So that is the, the large language models that are focused predominantly on text, okay? Now, uh, with images, there are, you know, different ways of doing this. One of the ways uh, that was, you know, quite relevant up until quite recently is generative adversarial models. But this seems to have been supplanted now by, by a technique called diffusion, okay? And this is basically taking a bunch of, you know, images um, that have been labeled already and then adding them into a latent space by training the model. So effectively, it starts with an image that has a specific, uh, uh, you know, semantic meaning to it. So it is, you know, being described in text, takes that image and progressively adds noise to it inside of this latent space, okay? Uh, and that's during the training phase. But then during the generation phase, it will start with a bunch of text that you give it and then a random piece of noise. And then it will progressively just take the exact same process it did in the training just backwards. So it now starts with noise and then removes noise progressively to get to a generated image, okay? So again, much like the generative adversarial networks, it trains over time by saying that, you know, if I was to give you this kind of image, um, what would you call it? And then progressively removing noise until you get to a point with a classifier that it would be an image that meets your class uh, uh, the, the classification you gave it at the start of that process. Okay. They are a little bit more complex, but, uh, but that's the general idea. It's the sort of adding of noise and the training and removing of noise during the generation. Um, video is also something that can be generated. Uh, so this is some of the latest media to be generated. It's not quite there just yet, um, but uh, it, it is a field that is moving at a tremendous pace at this point in time. So some of the video, uh, video that is generated is done you know, absolutely from scratch, but you also have things that have been rigged that you can use to create uh, videos like the one I want to show you quite now that is very, very fast. So I've added a link here to a guide on how to make this specific video, but uh, I don't think I have any sound at this point. Um, so I don't think you guys can hear this, but uh, if I skip over that one, um, but that is basically just a short piece of text that was uh, generated, uh, generated using ChatGPT. It then had a voice um, that was taken from, uh, now I forget the website. Um, but there is a number of websites that uh, that will allow you to generate voice from text that is getting better and better and better. And then a video generation engine was used to create that specific woman conveying that specific piece of text using the voice that was added. And it takes about half an hour to go through the process of generating exactly the same thing. Okay, not counting processing time. That's uh, That's a little bit more complex. But, uh, and I mean, those are some of the base uh, applications. Uh, they are also things that have changed, you know, quite drastically in the last, uh, you know, couple of months. Uh, some of them being Langchain. So that is the ability to, instead of just throwing a prompt at your large language model, you now give it a much more vague instruction and allow it to generate sub prompts, which are basically like the steps that it would follow. So in that example in the top left, you would give it, um, you know, the prompt of making a cake and saying, what ingredients and steps do I need to, uh, to follow in order to make a cake? And it would then split that up into two different processes, the one being to kind of collect the number of ingredients you need, and the other uh, process being work out the number of steps. And then it would work out dynamically down the line how to bring those things together. So at what point do you need which ingredients in order to make this cake? Um, so language chain is quite uh, quite exciting. Auto GPT again, another great way to uh, to create your own kind of virtual assistant, um, uh, which I would very much advise everyone to to play around with. I haven't had enough time to play around with it, to be honest, but uh, it's definitely quite exciting. And one that I'm actually quite excited about is the alpaca technique. And this was a huge jump forward uh, that we weren't expecting at uh, at the time that it dropped. But basically, up until this year, I mean, to train something like ChatGPT would take 
millions and millions of, of dollars of compute time because it just is a huge model. And what Stanford did is they basically instructed, um, it, was, it was actually Llama, not ChatGPT that they used, but that's the meta version of, a, or the meta large language model. They gave Llama a bunch of instructions to say that these are the kinds of pieces of text that we would need in order to develop our own large language model. So please will you generate for us a data set that is an optimal way or an optimal data set to create a large language model like yourself if we were to train it on a small, a much smaller machine. And it then did that. So they found they could get a large language model that had about the same performance as GPT-3, which is one of the forerunners of ChatGPT, and it cost them about $600 of compute time. So it really has democratized the creation of these large language models to a point that, that pretty much anyone can, can develop them. Um, as with many of their projects, they've also made this available you know, freely uh, on, on GitHub. So you can absolutely go through the process yourself and develop your own large language model using this technique. So that is, is kind of touching on the technology. So, I mean, really the, the start of this talk was where does this leave us as universities? Uh, because things have just changed so fundamentally you know, from what they were five years ago. So it, it really is clear that I mean, the world of generated content is, is huge, it is here to stay, and it is very, very available to our students. Um, it is very different to what it was five years ago, and we need to pivot. So if we want to make sure that we are still relevant at universities, we want to make sure that we are teaching our students the kinds of skills that are going to be able to use so that they can remain economically viable going forward. Um, you know, they, they, we shouldn't just be teaching them things that they, that they can generate themselves with no effort whatsoever. There needs to be some core to the curriculum that is still teaching them relevant skills. Okay? And these are just some of the thoughts that I have around. Now, something that, that has been in conversation for quite a long time, probably about 2009 when, when this was published, was, you know, that there is this consensus around this idea of 21st century skills. Okay? So the thought is that in order for students to stay competitive in a market that changes as quickly as it is changing at the moment, well, 2009 wasn't changing as quickly as it is now, but uh, these are the sort of 12 skills in three categories that they identified as being probably the most relevant. Okay? And I think we should start with these, but update them with the kinds of knowledge that you would need to sort of leverage uh, the tools that are available to you now. So the first uh, sort of category they've got is the learning skills, what they call the four C's, of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, okay? So this is where you will use to kind of critically reason about um, you know, information and find the truth. So you need to be able to critically think about the things that a large language model is telling you check if it's actually true, know where to find information that is you know, a core version of the truth and use that effectively, okay? Creativity and collaboration are still going to be important, but it's not just gonna happen with other humans. You're going, to be, you're going to need to be able to be creative and collaborative with machines that are going to generate a part of the work that you're working on. And again, uh, communication becomes uh, not just your ability to write, or you know, create slides, but you need to be able to communicate ideas. Okay? You need to have the ability to convey things at a higher level, whether some of the medium that you're using has been generated or not. Okay? So that communication needs to be on the, on the idea level. Okay? Next is literacy skills. So again, uh, this is all media, so not just you know, uh, reading and writing. But uh, students need the ability to consume vast amounts of media, but at the same time, they need to be able to generate media. So they need to be able to use tools to generate images, to generate text, to generate video, to generate sound, uh, because it's gonna become more and more relevant in, in different jobs. Um, and one of the things that is going to be important uh, in terms of literacy is constantly being aware of what is happening in the market that you are in so that you know which skills are economically viable in the environment that you're in so that if anything changes that you can pivot effectively. Okay. 
Finally, life skills. Um, so one of the things you will have to be much more than what it was uh, in the past is the ability to be a lifelong learner. Things are going to change so quickly and are already changing so quickly that uh, students need to be flexible. They need to be able to pivot quickly should the job that they're currently doing suddenly become completely automated. So someone brings out some tool that makes your job suddenly become not economically viable you should be able to pivot, you know, using some ability to, to learn a new skill that is relevant in your environment uh, to keep yourself relevant. Again, um, even though you need to be able to generate content and, you know, uh, convey those ideas, what is going to become more and more relevant is social skills and leadership. Because, I mean, so many things can be generated, so many things can be done with very little input costs. If you can lead a team and you know, conv convince people to follow your vision, uh, that is something that is likely going to be a much more valuable skill than necessarily just being able to develop things, okay? Uh, and then finally, being able to adapt to new technologies. Um, so being able to take on something that has been developed into your field, and, uh, and use it as quickly as possible is something that all lifelong learners should be able to do uh, going forward. Okay, now my final uh, section that I actually just wanted to talk about is, is really touching a little bit more on the pedagogical aspect of, of the university. So, I mean, where does this leave us in terms of education and specifically in assessment? So how can these tools help us in our pedagogy, okay? So, I mean, previously, we've always done things in the same way. We've used tests, we've made students write, you know, reports and all sorts of things like that. But with these generative AIs, it allows us to get our students to explore things that are outside of their skill set. Um, and, and, and this may allow us to have a much deeper engagement with material than what we've had in the past. And obviously what is, what is relevant here is prompt engineering. So it's the act of using natural language to explain to an artificial intelligence what you would like it to do. And uh, the ex example I'm gonna use here is, uh, is Midjourney. So not necessarily ChatGPT, um, but again, like most of the large language models, Midjourney is just going to allow me to give it text in the form of a prompt and it's gonna generate an image for me, okay? So how I used this sort of tool, it wasn't necessarily just my journey. I used my journey, my students didn't. But uh, what I put forward for my students was an assignment where they would report on something like they would do in the past, but I asked them to use artificial intelligence to generate more than just the report that they would hand in for me, okay? So the report was specifically on the Turing test and the implications for artificial intelligence. So it's basically the first you know, introductory thing that you, that you have uh, in a course on artificial intelligence. I then at the same time gave them a short story. It's a bit of a horror story called The Difference, okay? which basically has a chat log um, between an anonymous person on the one side and then people that log in constantly and then have quick conversations with that person. And it really shows how horrific it would be if you had, on the one hand, an artificial intelligence that has become self-aware, or alternatively, it could literally be a person that is locked in a room with nothing accessible to them other than this computer begging to be let out of this room. And how would you, how would you tell the difference between these two things? I mean, what would, what would a person have to do to convince you that they are a human being if an AI is sufficiently capable of convincing you of the same thing? And what kind of you know, problem does that create? And with that, I then had the students also generate you know, images. So they conveyed things like concern. You know, this is something that for some of the students was really worrying. Um, so a lot of their images were quite dark. But then at the same time, I had students that were thinking about the future um, and saying that this is actually a really exciting time. And you know, they, they were excited about the ability to collaborate with robots and, and, and work in an environment that is gonna be fundamentally different in 10 years time to what it is now. Um, some of them just had a lot of fun with the concept and, and they really focused on this concept of learning. 
uh, you know, and just saying that it is going to be a really exciting time to be alive because you constantly have to learn. And that is, you know, something that humans really, really enjoy. So giving them the ability to just be creative actually led to so much more, you know, richness in the assignment um, that that the students uh, that the students uh, gave gave input uh, gave uh, um, uh, reports on. And if we move to this world where students are not just given text reports to do, but multimedia submissions, um, and at the same time asking them to perform actions that we not be part of their core curriculum, we can force them to explore things in new ways and think outside the box. Okay? So that was the, the one side of it. The other side that I found worked very, very effectively, and I would also recommend, is the concept of co-creating of assignments. So previously in machine learning, I would say to students, you know, here is a data set, here is a machine learning technique, you know, apply this technique and report your findings on, you know, what you learned through the process. What I did this year, which was, which was quite fundamentally different, is I asked the students to find me a data set. So find something that you think is in, interesting. I, you know, exposed them to a number of machine learning techniques, but I also said to them, you know, find me a different machine learning technique that you think is interesting and explore that one. Apply this technique. And then while you are reporting on your finding, uh, use, you know, generative AI to write your report for you. You don't have to write everything from scratch. Focus on those things that are relevant to your learning. And finally, the, the core part here is reflect. Reflect on the learning that took place during this process. Don't just write a report. Tell me what you learned, what you didn't learn, what you found confusing, um, and really engage with the material. So I want you to imagine a world where technical students can make art, mathematics students can write stories, literature students can create mobile apps. With the ability to generate things, we really can start expecting our students to integrate uh, you know, concepts in a multidisciplinary way, unlike anything they have done before. Okay. So finally, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Things are changing incredibly quickly, and it is an existential risk to universities if they do not react to this appropriately. However, we should focus on those 21st century skills and make sure that we adapt them to the changes in the environment that is happening, and we want to make sure how to do this in an ethical, safe, and sustainable way. Okay? If you wanted to renew your curriculum, now is the time. There has never been a better time to, to update your curriculum than it is now. Okay? And something to take into account is from an internationalization perspective, everyone is where we are now. It's not like people in America or, you know, Europe and universities that have lots of money are suddenly, you know, just making the change overnight. They are just as freaked out about these things as we are. So if you wanted to leapfrog into the future and take a leading role, now is the opportunity. And at that point, I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, there's lots of references at the end. But uh, at this point, if there are any questions, I welcome them. Thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Yapi, for the very interesting talk. And you can hear the big applause. Are there questions for Yapi? Here we go. And then I'll check if there are questions online. Thank you, Yapi, for a fantastic presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, two questions. One very quick one is where do you get your amazing images from? Are they <laughs> IA generated? And the second slightly longer one is, so one of those live skills was critical thinking. Uh, and I'm fascinated by the cognitive impact of AI. So if we look at something like long division, for example, uh, if no student ever does long division if we just have calculators to do the division for us i don't feel that that's going to have a huge cognitive impact on the human race but if a child never constructs a sentence from scratch if all they ever do is prompt an ai language generating tool to do that what's your knee jerk for the cognitive impact on on human beings I'm curious thanks Okay, um, so first, yes, uh, absolutely everything is generated. Uh, I, I, at this point, I've pretty much added, uh, you know, generative AI to all of my workflows. So absolutely all of my art is, is generated. The only one that isn't is, uh, is actually that one that's on prompt engineering. 
that was just a really cute picture that I found, but everything else was, was generated. In terms of the, of the cognitive impact, and that is actually when I mentioned in the, the first uh, couple of slides where I said the things you should be talking about is fundamental knowledge. That is something that all of our fields need to have a very long look at to see what is fundamental and what is not, okay? Because I would agree with you about long division, okay? But if a child never learns what the division symbol means, they, they need to have some understanding of what it means to divide one number by another, okay? For them to use a calculator effectively, okay? So, so you need to sit down and think, okay, but what things do, do students actually need to know for them to use these tools effectively? Because even things like, like uh, coding, um, you know, the AI can write great code, but sometimes it does it badly and it doesn't debug appropriately. So you would need to understand the basic constructs of coding languages to be able to use those tools effectively. And that is where we should be focusing at the moment. Um, one of the, the conversations I had quite recently, and it, and it was a, a very uh, heated conversation at the time, was actually, I mean, whether we should allow students to use these things even in assignments and examinations. And the, the response that came was, well, I mean, as universities, we shouldn't just be teaching them, uh, or teaching students kind of vocational skills. So when you're teaching computer science like I am, you shouldn't just be teaching students to code. You should be teaching them to solve problems. You should be think, teaching them to think in an abstract way. You, you should be teaching them higher order skills, okay? And the fundamental question that came out of that was if you are scared of artificial intelligence and you think that everything you do in your degree can be generated, then are you really teaching those skills that you claim to be teaching that an AI isn't generate, uh, isn't capable of doing? And that is a, a fundamental question that you should be asking in your department. Is it something that you are teaching correctly? Or are you teaching skills that when the student finishes their three-year degree and goes into industry, they have absolutely nothing to bring to the table because everything they can do can just be generated? It's a hard conversation. It really is but it is very necessary at this point in time. Thank you, Yabdi. There is a question from uh, our online participants, Emil. Emil, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Professor. And uh, can you get me? Yes, yes I hear you. Okay, um, I'm Dr. Miyoto from the University of Boya in Cameroon. I am a nuclear physics uh, researcher. So I, I, I've been trying to I've been thinking of getting uh, AI to, to use it for my research, but I've been worried about the ethical uh, side of it. I, I'm not sure where we are on this. Is it, is it allowed? I saw, I saw a few months ago, um, one researcher wrote a paper with AI as a co-author. I'm not sure how does one do this? Where, where does one do the dividing line? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And I mean, that is one of those uh, things that I also mentioned at the beginning to say that you need to absolutely be discussing that in your department, because, I mean, if you consider concepts like plagiarism and copyright and authorship, uh, I mean, at what point is an AI a co-author or, you know, is it only a source? And if it is a source, the problem is that... Uh, as a co-author, it doesn't necessarily, and I mean, I've submitted a paper with, with ChatGPT as a co-author to a conference, so I'm totally guilty of that. Um, but it is not a person that necessarily thinks by itself because the concept of authorship is, I have contributed to the thinking in this paper or the results in this paper in a meaningful way, and therefore I am a co-author, okay? So the argument is, ChatGPT is generating things statistically, okay, with no further thinking. It is just absolutely, you know, word for word generating the sentence, okay? So from that definition, it is not thinking and therefore can't be a co-author. But at the same time, okay, the output that's given from that, something like ChatGPT changes over time. So if you reference ChatGPT, someone else may not get the same results as you when they ask the same question. 
in which case that is not the same as a source like you would use in a normal paper because the idea with a source is I can look at your reference list, read all the things you've read, and I can replicate your findings. And that's kind of the scientific method that we use. The way I've approached it, um, and again, this is more in the pedagogical sense rather than the, than the academic writing sense, but I've focused quite heavily on the prompt aspect of things. So instead of saying that I am interested only in the generated part, I'm very interested in, in the actual questions you're asking so that I can follow what your thinking was through the report that you've generated. Um, and that's what I would actually uh, you know, answer against. Um, and that is how I would also suggest using it in, in, in academic writing. But uh, that said, there are, there are some things that it does incredibly well that I absolutely would advise anyone to use. Um, for example, one of the, the applications I saw quite recently that I will definitely use in my next literature review is if you use something like AS Review, uh, which is a tool for systematic literature reviews, um, it will take the, uh, you take something like Scopus, so a database from Scopus, and um, you enter into a machine learning model, you know, five papers that you think are relevant and five that are not relevant, and then a database of 5,000 papers that you got from Scopus with their abstract and, and title information. And then it uses active learning to start presenting you what it thinks it is the, the least certain about. So it's a binary classifier. So it says, you know, some papers are relevant, some papers are irrelevant. And it does, an, a, 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 you know, it applies itself to all of the papers that are unmarked at the moment. And then it says, well, this paper, I am absolutely uncertain of whether it's, you know, relevant or irrelevant. And it presents you that paper, okay? And then you make the decision. So the human is the oracle. So you say that one is relevant or not relevant. And every time you do that, the model updates itself. And what they found is that when you look at those 5,000 papers that, uh, that were on, uh, on Scopus, by only going through like 10% of them, you can build an AI that will work around your literature review to recommend pretty much all the relevant papers. And there's you know, multiple nature papers to show that they've actually found all the papers using that technique. So that's the one side of it, is to, to make the, the, the review side much shorter. But the next process is you take all of those papers that have now been you know, selected as relevant in your systematic literature review and take their abstracts and throw that into ChatGPT and then say to it, please write me just the outline of a systematic literature review paper showing which parts are the most relevant for me to cover to make sure that I touch all the bases, okay? And then you do the actual writing. So you're not so much using it as a co-author, but allowing it to, to guide your structure um, more than actually the content inside of it. And the final comments here, I'm talking a lot. I, this is why Renee asked me to do these things and Francesco asked me because I never shut up. But um, I, I think there is also an element of, I, I don't know if, if pride is the right word, but it is the word I'm going to use, that, that, that concept of academic pride, where even if a machine could generate a paper, uh, I'm starting to think that uh, one of the things that we as academics do, as researchers do, is the generation of those papers. So it's almost more like that artistic, you know, creative devaluation. So that even if you could generate a really great image, it's not the same as getting an artist to create you a unique image by hand. And, and I think that sort of thinking is something that you should just consider. Um, so using it as a tool, absolutely. I think it is a brilliant tool. It is one that you need to check because sometimes it does hallucinate. But I think at the same time, taking ownership of your of your academic writing is, is actually quite important. I, I hope that that gives some guidance because I've spoken around something that is quite difficult, but, uh, but I hope it helps. Thank you very much, Yapi. I'm just concerned about the time now because uh, I know that this venue is used for something else at six today. So we need to come to an ordered end. So Yapi, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. We will have uh, lots of time to discuss uh, outside. <laughs> yeah, thank you to the online Great. participants as well. We will upload the talk uh, on YouTube latest tomorrow. And um, I'm sure we'll invite uh, Yapi again soon to join us for a second part of this discussion. Thank you very much, Yapi. Thank you and good evening Thanks to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everyone, goodbye.